Okay, so with surgery treatment, we know that the surgical gold standard for meningioma is complete resection of tumor and any involved dural bone. And recognizing that the so-called benign meningioma regrew despite apparently satisfactory surgery, made that in 1957, Simpson described a classification system to define the risk of recurrence following surgery alone based on the surgeon's intraoperative assessment of the extent of resection. So this is known as the Simpson grading. Uh, I think we, almost, we almost know it. Um, the Simpson grades of resection are established here with the corresponding who grade and the extent of resection. So the first grade, according to the World Health Organization, is defined as gross total resection of tumor, dural attachment, and abnormal bone, defined as a gross total resection. Who grade two says that is gross total resection of tumor, coagulation of dural attachment with the extent of resection of gross total. Who grade three says that is a gross total resection of tumor with a resection or coagulation of dural attachment or extradural extension. For example, invaded or hyperostotic bone with also being a gross total resection. Who grade four says that it's a partial resection of tumor with a subtotal resection and who grade five, it's only a biopsy of the tumor being also subtotal resection. Um, the one thing on that, I think it's not who grade, who grading refers to the pathology. So these are the Simpson grades. And the only caveat to keep in mind is when this grading scale was proposed, it was proposed on patients before we had operating microscopes, before and not nearly the illumination that we have now. So it was much more just the surgeon like looking in with their bare eyes, or maybe some loops. I'm not sure if they even had how they used those back then, but it was very different than if we like do a Simpson one resection where, you know, I'm leave, I'm saying, oh, it's Simpson two or Simpson three because I leave like a tiny margin or something. Also in meningioma surgery. Uh, we don't routinely check margins. When you do cancer therapy, you take, go to the edge of the dura or something, you check a margin and say, are there cells here? We don't do that in meningioma surgery. So, and, and that's not incorporated in any of this. So it's all assuming based off kind of your gross looking. And some of these, this gets debated over the years because um, people don't know because we just don't know. It's like, well, I left a little bit there or not, and we never checked it with pathology. We didn't send margins. So there is some ambiguity in this, um, but the goal is the more complete you can get is all is holds true. But this is Simpson grade, not who grade. Okay, sure. Um, considering technical things and strategies in meningioma, First, we have to make a meticulous pre-surgical planning with careful attention to neurovascular anatomy. Because as we know, there are a lot of blood vessels in, in the brain and in the meninges and surrounding all of these structures. So it, it has to be made a pre-surgical planning so the surgery can be successful. Um, talking about radiotherapy or um, SRS, an alternative strategy is to leave meningioma invading the sinus that can be monitored or treated with adjuvant radiotherapy or SRS. And talking about image gating, um, we know that the use of intraoperative MRI and CT um, can be used to update neuronavigation and identify residual tumor. And some of other advances that have been made with image guiding is dotated PET, which can discriminate between meningioma and normal tissues with greater sensitivity than MRI. And it may be particularly useful for meningioma with intraosseous involvement. And it may also be used as a predictor of tumor growth rate. And also an intraoperative imaging can be used for emerging approaches such as adapt adaptive hybrid surgery, whereby the surgeon plans to leave a small, deemed unresectable residual that can be treated with postoperative SRS. And finally, for recurrent meningioma, we know that in, patient, in patients in this situation, the surgical challenges are compounded, are compounded by scar tissue, and also the underlying brain is more friable and susceptible to injury. So the indications for further surgery in, including symptomatic meningioma growth and reduction of the tumor to leave a smaller target for postoperative radiation. Uh, Anna, sorry to interrupt. I just had a question for Dr. McGill. 
Um, yeah, sure. So, Dr. Miguel, when it comes to, um, I guess, neuronavigation with meningiomas, um, you know, I, uh, when do you typically use neuronavigation in meningioma uh, resection? Would, it, would you use it for like a meningioma that's located perhaps maybe on the frontal lobe versus something that's more on the base of the brain? I, so just cost is not a consideration in where I'm practicing just because we have an international audience. I know that changes, but I use it every case because I want to tailor my craniotomy. I want to take, even if it's just a convexity meningioma, I can tailor exactly what I want, put things right on it. I think it's a, a great help and adjunct just otherwise you don't have to do quite as big. You know, you know, right where the edge of the sagittal sinus is, you can avoid complications. So I use imaging for every case. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.